With the release and online game community praise of Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, many are left wondering if this can be the new model for AA video games. Let's chat about it in the comments below, but first, my opinion, I'm Tarmac, and this is Feature Creep. The game industry certainly has a cost problem, not in the way many people think, that being an uncontrollable rise in production costs, but more of what can almost be described as a corporate addiction problem where it comes to the direction of game budgets. In the fight for supremacy among game publishers and the stock market, budgets have a tendency to rise because big numbers keep shareholders salivating like a college student who just discovered the Costco liquor store. A part of that overall increase results in an ever-widening gap between the independent market and the AAA market. As AAA production and marketing costs rise, along with the requisite increase in the number of gamers worldwide, the difference in production quality between low-budget titles and the upper tier becomes quite stark. As a point of comparison, something as enormous as the world of Horizon Zero Dawn is simply outside the realm of competition where it comes to indie games. And indie games who try to make these kinds of enormous wide-sweeping worlds are relegated to the inevitable failure of procedural generation, just like No Man's Sky. So recently, we got to see the release of an independent title with a big budget, relatively speaking. This does happen from time to time, but in this case, it's unique in a couple of ways. Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice was developed by Ninja Theory, the studio behind Heavenly Sword and several Devil May Cry games for the PlayStation platform. Hellblade is a third-person action story game with a heavy dose of mind games thrown in for good measure. As you can see from the footage, if you're not familiar with it, the graphical fidelity is great. The facial animations are second to few, and while audio can often be extremely subjective, I think it's safe to say that this hit the mark as well. So we arrive at the question, can Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice provide any context into the mid-tier market, and can it be used as a shining star of independent development? Ninja Theory terms it an independent AAA game, which I think is a wee bit of a stretch personally. Hellblade comes in at a $30 price point, half that of the traditional AAA game industry production line. And given related numbers provided by Ninja Theory themselves about how many sales the game would need to make to break even, and how quickly that actually ended up happening, the game very likely had a budget somewhere between $6 and $8 million to make, assuming 30% fees at the digital retail level. It's obvious right out of the gate that this just doesn't compete against big budget titles. One thing that I think it's reasonably safe to say is that Hellblade did prove that there is a market for mid-tier, third-person, high-fidelity $30 games, assuming that they're done right. Whether this is a repeatable event remains to be seen, as an anomaly is always more likely to receive some element of viral marketing simply by virtue of being a rare event in the first place. But it did show that the market exists, a market that is hardly surprising. As mentioned when I started this piece, the upper end of the AAA production is moving away from indie development. There's a sizable gap between indie development and something like the next Far Cry game. The more that AAA moves in that direction, the wider the gap becomes, leaving a segment of the market underserved. Now, I've seen a number of arguments put forward, many from a particular Gama Sutra article by Sina Shibazi, which I've linked in the description, that claim Hellblade cannot be used as a barometer for developer success. In truth, while I do agree with a few of the claims, the overall premise troubles me a little. Hellblade was very clearly both a critical success and, according to the developer, a financial success as well, as it exceeded their targets of break-even in half the time expected. Certainly, this may fail to meet the expectations of the AAA publishers, but as we've seen with Square Enix and its disappointment that Tomb Raider only sold 11 million units in four years, expectations at the top end often seem outside of reality. To start, let's address the claim of financial success directly. Years ago, the target for copies sold was around 300,000 units as a break-even point for this game. It sold 250,000 units in its first week, tapering down to a total of 500,000 units over the first three months, which is now beyond their break-even point and into profit territory, according to a dev diary posted on the Hellblade site. Take that pattern out a year from launch, and it'll be surprising if the game didn't double the money invested, over a four to five year period since development began. This is normal sales tapering over time, and the initial prediction by Ninja Theory was that it would take them six months to reach that break-even point. All of this before any deep sales or bundle inclusions. All of this for digital-only distribution, which helped reduce the cost, as it often does. To say that this is not a significant financial success to hit your target in half the expected time is simply to compare it to the wrong measuring stick. A group the size of Electronic Arts, while maintaining significant economies of scale, also has significant drawbacks as well. Economies of scale, for those not aware, refers to how individual costs of a project can be lower because the company can in effect invest in bulk. 
For example, large-scale production of hundreds of thousands of video game boxes is much cheaper for each box than it would be if you wanted to make just 500 boxes of your favorite indie game. Ninja Theory, with its 20-member development team, will pay for accounting, lawyers, and such on an as-needed basis, rather than salary full-time. It'll have little in the way of middle management, with the corporate structure effectively being executive and employees. Sure, a big project might be able to get more done, but you lose efficiencies very quickly when getting to the size where you employ managers whose job is merely to manage and not work on the games. As a result, these efficiencies which Ninja Theory can take advantage of through their rather experienced development team allows them to complete more in the same amount of human hours. This point was brought up in the Gama Sutra article as though having experienced people was some kind of uncommon entity in the game industry. The Hellblade team ranges from 5 to 10 years of experience on an individual basis, which is great, but hardly what would count for a veteran title in most other places. That said, the game industry is doing a very good job of creating situations where experienced developers in that range have to find new jobs lately, and it's been doing this for years. This, of course, brings us to the scope of the project. Senua's Sacrifice had a limited scope, as does every game in existence to a greater or lesser extent. The primary issue with game scope, as it pertains to game development, unfortunately, is that of public perception. One thing that the AAA group has done over the years is push the idea that gameplay duration is more important than just about anything else. This is the Games as a Service push, hundreds of hours of gameplay, and I plan to do an entire video on this at some point. The concept of gamers needing to only buy one or two games a year and just continue to play those same games all year while loading their accounts with microtransaction purchases is, in my view, extremely damaging to the viability of smaller developers. But I digress. The scope of a project helps determine the cost of said project. The Binding of Isaac will be much easier to produce from a graphical standpoint than The Witcher 3, or perhaps I should say less costly. Everything your game doesn't do helps to maintain a lower cost, but it also allows a project to become more focused, more precise. Is every activity in Grand Theft Auto V fun? Or are there core elements which are great, but most of the side content is weak? I'd argue the latter. There's this notion that games must do everything, and that in order to get value for money, you need to buy a game that is going to give you hundreds of hours of content. As though games like that in general actually manage to provide hundreds of hours of great content which is usually not true. A precise scope allows the developer to zone in on what makes their game special, and this is where Hellblade shines. It focused on a very particular psychological experience. In fact, a very similar example can be found within Portal, another game done at a very comparably low budget which focused unerringly on its core strengths such that it became a gaming classic. Having a limited scope is not a detriment, except in marketing because of what gamers have been conditioned to expect from games. It takes finesse, but while differentiating your product through a smaller scope may reduce your potential market, it will bring in folks tired of games that do everything poorly, instead of a few things really well. All of that said, one thing that I think gets lost in the shuffle of wonder surrounding Hellblade is that this is hardly a new thing. It's just new for the genre that they chose. City Skylines was made by a studio with around 17 employees and sold Hellblade levels of units in month one. Skylines didn't focus on realism in facial animations, and Hellblade didn't focus on transportation AI. Well, technically Skylines didn't focus on transportation AI either, but that might be an unfair snark on my part. Portal 1 was made by about 8 people, and Portal 2 roughly 40. The best reference I could find was for a core 8-person team on The Witness, which would have done well even without Jonathan Blow's name recognition. Soma and Amnesia, a machine for pigs, were both under 20 people in development. Short of Portal 1, which was made by students, all of these games had experienced developers, which is hardly a surprise, nor indeed a mark against their respective games in any way. I deliberately left games built by Double Fine off this list as I didn't want to deal with the comments referencing poor money management, but it is fair to say that they likely belong here as well. Now, I am, of course, cherry-picking successes, and you can find plenty of AA flops, but that's true at all levels of development. These tiers of games do exist, they're just not as common because of funding restrictions. This may sound counterintuitive, but finding investment funding isn't a linear relationship. That is to say that asking for $10 million in funding isn't 10 times more difficult to find than $1 million in funding. It's often easier, in fact, to find investors at $10 million than it is to find investors at $1 million. Especially in North America, because those who are investing vast sums of money aren't interested in wasting their time on a $1 million project and those at the level you'd be targeting for a $1 million project are often too risk-averse. 
But the last thing you want is to ask for more money than you need. Or you end up with the scope creep problem and just become another in the ever-expanding trove of games doing too many things, and none of them really well. And of course, the more successful your AA game is, the more likely your next title falls in the lap of a AAA publisher. So the underserved market cannibalizes itself as well, unfortunately. To summarize, I think that Hellblade can serve as a role model for developers. Limiting its scope and focusing on those core strengths are precisely what helped to make it a success and stand out in a sea of brown. Maintaining a small team size devoid of mid-management bloat not only makes a project more agile but reduces costs dramatically. And with tools becoming more affordable, being available to many studios for free with an after-release revenue share sales metric, the floor of game development has been significantly raised. Every game can very quickly look better today than 10 years ago simply by virtue of the power of engines like Unity and Unreal. All of that said though, I will level one criticism at Ninja Theory because I think it hurt them immensely. They relied too heavily on word of mouth and free marketing avenues like reviews. I think it's likely that three or four million dollars spent on marketing would have turned this game into a million unit seller in the first six months. The Sony exclusive exposure will have helped, but it could have been better. The fact that the numbers may not look impressive when comparing to the expectations of big publishers is largely irrelevant. But even at that level, if you tell someone you can double their money in four to five years, that beats the pants off of most mutual funds. Is it risky? Gamers can be fickle, so sure it's risky, as are most projects in the game industry outside of guaranteed franchises like Star Wars. But even then, Battlefront 2 may turn out to prove the concept of guaranteed franchises false. And the best part, in my opinion, is an advantage that Ninja Theory had, which few AAA studios have, since a majority of game developers are in many ways digital manufacturing lines these days. The developers not only cared about the project, as any developer regardless of market segment does, but they had real influence over its creative design and direction, which is something most AAA developers can only dream about, and why so many devs go indie after getting tired of the rat race. What do you think about the double A or B or whatever you want to call the market gap between indie and the big publishers? Would you like to see more $30 games with a precise scope like Hellblade? Please do post your comments down below. Feature Creep is a Patreon funded show on the channel, which matters even more since YouTube started demonetizing everything the instant it's uploaded instead of a day or so afterwards. Thanks for supporting the channel, whether through Patreon or just watching and enjoying or otherwise. My name's Tarmac. That's all I have to say.